Hi, great team. So we're getting near to the end of the section. So what I want to do in this video is to explain another um, transport system in your body that maybe you haven't heard about. And then I'm going to look at the, um, the PowerPoint on cardiovascular diseases, cardio, heart, vascular, blood vessel diseases. All right, so let's have a look here. Okay, you may remember this um, PowerPoint from the last time. Okay, and we've already dealt with the um, structure and function of blood. Now, what I want to show you on the next slide is this. Now, a lot of us don't know that we've got an extra transport system. It's called the lymphatic system. Now, this is a system of drainage vessels in your body because at the, at the capillaries, okay, remember we learned about little arteries breaking up into smaller capillaries and then becoming small, um, the capillaries joining to form little veins and the veins, um, you know, the venules then lots of veins join up and then go back to the heart. All right, so there's lots of diffusion across here and lots of plasma leaks out and becomes what we call tissue fluid. So in between all of our cells, there's a little bit of tissue fluid and that's needed because um, things can't diffuse into or out of cells if they're not dissolved in water. So in order for oxygen and glucose to move into cells, there needs to be tissue fluid. So you can see the cells here, all right? And every single um, cell in your body is less than a you know, millimeter away from a capillary. So now, if lots of plasma leaks out of the blood vessels and becomes tissue fluid, you could get swelling, and that swelling is called edema. And there's a child with edema. And it could be due to a number of reasons. Sometimes it's because one of these lymphatic vessels are blocked. You can see how they are blind ending tubes. It's like you know, linked straws. And um, they take away this excess tissue fluid. And then all that tissue fluid goes back into larger lymph vessels. And it eventually drains into the, um, the arteries from your arms. So there's lots of these lymph vessels all over the body. In fact, you can see them over here. There's lots of them from the legs, from the arms. They've shown some of them here from the head and even from your abdominal organs. And all these little red circles, those are called lymph nodes. So for example, if I'm feeling sick and if you go to a doctor and you're not feeling so lacquer, then they sometimes feel your neck. And they're looking for those lymph nodes. They're trying to see if they are swollen. Now, the reason why they would be swollen when you are ill is because they store lots of white blood cells. And remember, white blood cells play a role in your immunity. So um, I've got a little, like a little ulcer, a little white swell in my mouth at the moment because the other day I was chewing something. Mm, I can feel it here. And I, I'm by mistake, but my, um, the inside of my lip or, you know, sometimes I get ulcers just because you run down or whatever. Um, so it, it's an indication that those lymph nodes in the area are actually, the white blood cells are working hard and they are um, being produced, well, they, they're working hard and they're trying to get rid of the infection in the area, okay? They're trying to get rid of the, the virus or the bacteria that are causing the infection. But now there's other reasons why your lymph vessel could become okay so that that was about um uh that was i was trying to tell you about lymph nodes and how they play a role in immunity and how lymph vessels normally drain away excess tissue fluid and eventually it goes back into the um, arm arteries but now sometimes okay if a person's in hospital for a long time and they you know they're in a coma and they're laying on the same spot the whole time what the nursing staff will do is move them on their side, on their, you know, they will um, move them throughout the day. Because if you don't walk around a lot, okay, if you are sedentary, sedentary means not moving around, then those lymph, um, the lymph vessels cannot cope with all this excess tissue fluid in between your cells from being taken up. So therefore, you know, there's not enough lymph. Okay, so basically, plasma in the blood becomes tissue fluid in between the cells. And then when it drains into these little green tubes, they're not really green, all right, then we call it lymph. And that lymph gets cleaned up along the way as it passes through these lymph nodes. And eventually the lymph gets put back into your, um, your blood um, arteries because your body recycles or else you would need to drink so much more water just to make enough lymph, let alone blood and everything else. Okay, so that's one way in which um, lymph drainage could be um, 
inefficient, okay, from being bedridden. Another way is when a parasite could actually block the, um, the lymph vessels, for example, in the legs. So if you watch TV, you know, those Body Bazaar programs and all of that, they sometimes show these people with really, really huge legs. Um, and it's because of a parasite that actually lives in the lymph vessels and blocks them. And then they get so much fluid build up in their um, lower limbs. And they, you know, sometimes they even have to have um, operations, et cetera, to try and get rid of it. All right, so that's the lymphatic system. Um, we're now going to move on to the diseases or health issues of the cardiovascular system. So let me go into that. And you've been watching some videos as well. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing this. Um, right, so cardiovascular disease, things that, you know, diseases affecting your heart and your blood vessels. I'm not going to go through lots here, lots of examples. All right, so they're degenerative diseases. In other words, they take time to develop. They cause problems over a long time, mainly when you get older, depending on how you looked after yourself when you were younger. So the one video talks about atherosclerosis. Sometimes it has an R over here, atherosclerosis, and that's from um, cholesterol, okay, or fatty material. You know, we need cholesterol. There's good and bad, and we need cholesterol in order to make hormones and cell membranes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if we have too much of the bad cholesterol, it's called LDL, right? L low length, low density lipoprotein. You don't need to know that. It can actually collect in those little coronary blood vessels that are in the wall of your heart, trying to supply the cells of that muscle, the wall of your heart, with oxygen and um, glucose and getting rid of waste. So that's what you would have seen in the video, the buildup of the plaque and how the lumen, the space inside the blood vessel, becomes really, really narrow. Think of a hose pipe in your garden that has got a stone stuck in it and then hardly any water can um, pass through. All right, and the video shows quite nicely how blood clots can form because of the narrowing, um, and then eventually, you know, part of the, the clot, this um, atherosclerosis or um, plaque breaks off, and then a blood clot, clot could form. All right, and these walls, okay, they also, because of all this fatty deposit, they become less elastic, so they can't, you know, um, they can't dilate, and um, go back to the normal shape to allow blood flow to pass through with the, you know, with the, um, the movement of the blood through by the beating of the heart. So there's another diagram. So the reason why I like to show this slide is because that is a cross section through a real blood vessel and that's all the plaque and there's the narrow opening through which the blood is flowing. And there they are. Okay, I don't know exactly which blood vessels we are, but these are, but there's a fatty deposit. It, really, it looks like a blocked drain pump. And there they've opened up in a blood vessel to show you the inside wall and how bumpy and lumpy and coated with fat it becomes. So what could happen? Well, you could end up with high blood pressure because basically you're trying to force the same amount of blood through tiny little blood vessels. If a blood vessel in the brain becomes blocked, you could have a stroke. If a blood vessel in the wall of the heart becomes blocked, you could have an art, a heart attack or a myocardial infarction, which is what the one little video talks about. Now, a stroke can be caused by two things. So I'll just talk about a few things because I think we need to know about this, and it might pop up in a comprehension. It's certainly not um, the kind of detail that I would expect you to, um, to study. And remember, always go and look at what's in your workbook. So if I, let me just open it up here. If I look at the workbook, Okay, on the cardiovascular diseases. Whoops, where's it gone? It's um, one page. All right, it's page 74. I'll give you a little bit about cholesterol. All right, and there's a fun fact there. Um, you know, that, that thing that we use to measure blood pressure, that cuff that they put around your arm and then they inflate it. Um, and basically what happens, if they, if they inflate that cuff around your arm, it squeezes those blood vessels. So now there's the major blood vessels. So now there's no blood flow. Then as they slowly release the pressure, then they can start, um, the, the, the machine picks up the, the um, dilating, you know, the blood vessels dilating because of blood passing through, um, the, you know, due to the beating of the heart. And then slowly it will go away again. So you get a figure like 120 over 80. Okay, it's the pressure. Um, the pressure in the blood vessels when the heart is contracting and then the lower figure is the pressure in the blood vessels and um, when the heart is relaxed because remember the heart 
contracts for half a second nearly and relaxes for half a second. Now, with blood pressure, the 120 over uh, 80, for example, is normal blood pressure. Um, if the gap between the two is very high, like 240 and 90, that's a really big gap. That means your heart, that 240, your heart is really trying to push blood through narrow blood vessels. And also, you know, if your blood pressure overall is too high, say 240 over 100 and something, that's rather dangerous. Blood pressure can also be low. So, you know, blood, may, blood flow to some parts of the body may be a little bit lower than usual, but it's not dangerous. I mean, some people naturally have low blood pressure. Mine is naturally low. So when it's cold now, when it's really cold, my fingers are going yellow, all right, because it's so cold. And then I've got to slowly heat them up or put gloves on. All right, so my blood pressure might, in some I know when I donated blood recently, you know, a couple of months ago, um, it was about uh, 98 over 65 or something like that, not 120 over 80. But that's normal for me. But when some people stand up with low blood pressure, you know, the blood feels like it drains out of your head um, and uh, they feel very really faint. Okay, so you need to be careful of that. All right, so that was a little bit off the beaten track. So what is the stroke caused by? So if a little blood vessel in your brain becomes blocked, it's called, I'm um, sorry, if it bursts, it's called a cerebral, that's brain, hemorrhage, bleed. A hemorrhage is a bleeding, bleeding on the brain. If it becomes blocked by a clot or by a bit of plaque from a blood vessel or the coronary blood vessels in the wall of your heart, and then blood cells, you know, it, it moves along and then blood cells gather around it, then it's called a thrombosis. And now a stroke means that part of the, um, the brain will actually be damaged. So if there's a bleed out, a little aneurysm is like a little balloon, like a little um, worn out region of a blood vessel. The walls become too thin and then that little portion might burst open. And then you've got bleeding into the brain, which puts pressure on the brain. And it could cause you know, that part of the brain to, to die or become less efficient. And that's a stroke. And then you get another type of stroke, ischemic. You don't need to know that. But if um, a clot forms in the brain, maybe because of cholesterol moving or whatever, or bad blood clotting, then you can see that, yeah, that anything past this blood clot is not going to receive oxygen. So that is also severe. And there's a, an X-ray or a scan of someone who has had a stroke. And you can see that whole region over there. Okay, That region was cut off from a blood supply. All right, and that could affect the person quite um, dramatically. So often stroke, um, people, stroke patients, um, if they've had a blood, um, a stroke in the right side of their brain, then they can't lift their arms evenly. So they'd lift the one arm high. So if the right brain is affected, the opposite side is not going to um, work properly. So they'd lift one arm high, but not the other one. Or if you look at them, then maybe, you know, the one side of this, if you ask them to smile, maybe that one side is down or you ask them their name or something a simple question about the day and then they can't they slur they can't really talk properly is another one um those are the main ones that we are, are told to look for when we do the first aid courses all right and you you know there's that window that golden hour you have to get them to the hospital where they can give um, anti-stroke medication because if that doesn't happen then that part of the brain has been deprived of oxygen for too long and then it could die, okay? And then they end up with these um, problems for the rest of their life, not being able to walk properly, eat properly, talk properly, lift things up, all of that. All right, now, okay, here are the symptoms. Oh, so also numbness or tingling on the other side of the body or loss of strength. They can't lift it up, they can't pick things up, or their face droops, or their leg you know, gets all um, lame, okay? And can't um, talk properly, loss of balance because now their leg, one leg isn't working properly. Sometimes they get abnormal vision because remember this side is the side affected. They get abnormal vision or double vision. Um, okay, so what happens if it's a coronary thrombosis instead of one that's in the brain, an ischemic thrombosis? Okay, you don't need to know that. So these little blood vessels that branch off the aorta are going to supply the actual heart muscle with oxygen because it's a pump it has to work it's got to you know it's got to produce energy from breaking down glucose and getting you know using oxygen to make atp energy now if that becomes blocked like with cholesterol you can see here there's a buildup of plaque and that's a serious serious problem all right 
um, then you end up with that fancy word, the myocardial infarction or the heart attack. And basically this part of the muscle here dies because it's no longer receiving oxygen, it becomes dead. All right, um, could result in heart failure. Heart failure means that the heart stops beating totally, which is that one little video without sound um, that you're going to watch. So there you can see a blood clot is forming in the area where there's cholesterol and those blood vessels are no longer working. And these are the early warning signs, pressure, feeling of pressure and pain and fainting and sweating and nausea. And now that's a heart attack, all right? I mean, in your brain, it's uneven lifting of arms or not being able to talk properly, et cetera. But if you're feeling a heart attack, I think it's in the TED talk that you watched yesterday, um, that they feel that pressure. And it's different for everybody. Women sometimes feel it differently to men. You know, some people feel pain going, going up their neck or in the jaw and the left arm usually doesn't, you know, they feel pain in the left arm, et cetera. All right. So this person having a heart attack also needs to get um, to, the, to the hospital very quickly. Okay, so the risk for cardiovascular disease, well, it's, you know, even I'm at fault, you know, I don't eat, yeah, it's hard to eat healthy in, in, in winter when we just want nice, warm, comforting food. We've got to make sure that we get enough veggies and fruit. So it's the diet that we have. It's all those extra things that we add to our diet. It's um, high animal fat, low fiber, not enough fresh fruit and veg. It's lack of exercise, okay? Um, I mean, we see those jokes flying around at the moment about, you know, post-COVID you know, and um, because people may be doing less exercise and you know, maybe eating you know, a bit more and watching too much TV and all of that, being more inactive. So guys, get out there. Okay, go enjoy the sunshine. All right, excessive stress. Okay, shame. The poor teacher standing at the front thing, hey? Okay, and genetic. You know, it could be um, something that's genetic that's been passed on through the family. All right, about, you know, um, cholesterol, in, it could be a genetic, um, it could be inherited from your family, um, your grandparents, your parents, whatever, because then your body is unable to cope with the bad cholesterol and it tends to collect in those little coronary arteries. Smoking is a really big no-no because it damages blood vessels. And if there's a poor diet, well, then you're going to get heart, um, high blood pressure because the the walls of the blood vessels become damaged and they can't stretch and recoil like they should whenever the heart pushes blood through them. So that's a big, big no-no. That could lead to high blood pressure. And on page 74, this a machine which measures high blood pressure, I mean, you do get uh, mechanic ones now that you just press a button. Okay, this is a, a handheld one. It's called a sphygmomanometer. Right. So what are the treatments available for coronary disease? Okay, I know this video is a bit long, but let's just get through this. There's just two treatments. So you could have a bypass operation, which is shown in the one little video clip, where they take leg veins. So this person is having a double bypass because this, these two little coronary arteries are blocked. So they take two leg veins so that oxygenated blood from the aorta can bypass the blockage. Just like if they're building a road and you take a detour on a sand, you know, a little stretch of sand to the side. All right, it pro provides an alternative route to blood flow. And there's another one. So now the heart muscle below still receives oxygen, but the people, you know, they have to get to hospital quickly to figure out what's going on here. Now there's another one. This is really interesting. It's called balloon angioplasty and there are so many new ways in which they do this. Um, so basically what they do is they, this catheter, um, I think I've got a picture on the next slide, they make a little slit in your groin area and then they thread this long catheter right through the aorta in the wrong way, because remember the blood flows down the aorta, and eventually through the aorta and through those little coronary blood vessels, right in there, okay, you will be under sedation and they do um, inject a dye into your, blood, into your blood so that they can see the blood vessels up on a screen. So if we go here, you can see here that these um, coronary blood vessels, they've got a blockage in them. That is dangerous because then your heart muscle will not be able to, you know, get enough oxygen. And this particular x-ray is called an angiogram. So this is what they do while they've got the patient on the table and they thread this catheter through all the way up the, up the you know, through the, the groin, you know, the, in between your, the top of your leg and your abdomen, basically, um, your torso, up all the way through, through the aorta and into that coronary blood vessel. And then on a screen, 
the physicians will be watching, okay, to see if there are any blood, um, sorry, blocked blood vessels like over here. And then what's really interesting, okay, the end of the catheter has got a little balloon. So there's a number of things that they can do. So either they can, you know, thread the catheter through into this coronary blood vessel and push that plaque against the wall. All right, it's, it was blocking the blood vessel. Now they push it against the walls, and then the person has to go on medication, a prop, a good diet with low cholesterol, and exercise, and eat healthy, and all of that. So there you can see the balloon is being expanded, and how that cholesterol is now. Let's just move me. There it was taking up a lot of space, hardly any blood flow, and now it's been pushed against the wall, and now there's more blood flow, or blood is able to flow more easily. And then they remove the catheter, all right? They're not going to leave it inside you. All right, so that's if it's not too bad, and if the person takes medication, et cetera, et cetera. So the patient will be evaluated. But now, where's my other one? Let's just have a look here. Okay, so there's some more um, blocked blood vessels. Look there totally blocked there's the catheter coming through they would have blown up the balloon and now that little blood vessel is open all right so this is amazing okay there's so many different types now this is called a stent um okay and they pass the, the same thing they pass the catheter through and it's got the balloon with a little stent around it i'm actually looking for i, I normally have a you know those little looks like polystyrene meshes that they put around pawpaws. I, I use that as an, you know, to demonstrate in class. So there's that stent. This thing costs like 10,000 Rand. It's probably much more now. And then they blow up the balloon. So it opens up the stent and then it stays there. All right. And then the person will take medication to reduce cholesterol, do ex, you know, exercise, um, eat healthily, stop smoking, all of that kind of thing. And then that's, um, the cholesterol will eventually hopefully go down. And then that stent stays there. Make sure that this cholesterol doesn't break off and go and block the coronary blood vessel or move through the blood and into the brain and cause a stroke. And there it is. And there you can see the balloon with a stent around it. The balloon blowed up, um, blown up, sorry. And then um, the stent is left behind. And they're really, really expensive. All right, so yes, you know, rest and diet. You know, we're not hunter gatherers anymore. We go to the shops, we go to takeaway uh, outlets all the time. You know, we and we're more sedentary. We're sitting on our computers. Yes, I know I am too now. And you know, we need to get out there. We need to exercise because it is a problem in the Western world. And I'm sure if you go look at graphs, now that's what I can do. I can go find a graph or something or some information. And it leads to lots of deaths in developed countries, developed meaning westernized countries with fast food outlets and you know, busy lifestyle and stress and all of that. Okay, now congenital heart disease. This is the last little thing. Congenital means you are born with it. There's nothing you can do about it. Maybe have an operation, but you're born that way. So we all have a hole in our hearts, believe it or not. And I think I have mentioned this before. So when, before we are born, there's a hole between the two atria. Because if your ventricles, um, so if you, this ventricle, the right ventricle pumps blood to the lungs, the lungs can't oxygenate the blood because the baby is inside the mother in the womb and there's fluid in their lungs. It's only when they are born and they take their first breath that all the fluid drains out of the lungs and then that little hole should close up with a little flap of tissue. It should close up straight away and then their heart starts, you know, it carries on beating and then the um, deoxygenated blood would then pass through the pulmonary artery to, to the lungs and oxygenated blood would return. Okay, so that hole closes up because in the heart, the lungs are functioning properly. So, um, so it's actually a hole in the septum. So there you can see there's a hole in the ventricle or it could be hole, a hole between the two atria. Um, sometimes it closes off a little bit later on in the child's life. Sometimes it's not very severe or they use surgery to actually close that little hole and you know, cover it up with some kind of surgical material. Okay, it depends. Now, one of my friends, her sister's daughter was born with a hole in the heart, congenital hole in the heart, and she's now at varsity, she's studying. Um, she actually lives in Germany and um, she never had the operation, but she's okay, so it wasn't very severe, but she had to really be careful about overexertion during exercise and that. And you know how they pick this kind of thing up is the, the babies. Well, if the baby's born and the fingers 
and you know all the extremities the lips the fingers and toes look blue because they're not getting enough oxygen it's called cyanosis so they look cyanotic and then they know that something is wrong and then there's lots of organizations this is a british based organization to you know help parents who are born with children with congenital heart defects and even in south africa there's always um different organizations who help parents and you know the families with or you know figure out how to look after child with these um, issues you know even children with down syndrome and other disorders etc and give them support and advice and help where they need it all right so that's just a bit of interesting information now heart transplant i'm sure you all know where the first heart transplant took place it was in south africa it was in um, the Grote School Hospital in Cape Town by Professor Christian Barnard. And um, he passed away a number of years ago, but I mean, he studied for many years. He was young, he went to America. He learned how to use the heart bypass machine, which is the machine that they put you on while they stop your heart, because now your heart can't pump blood around the body. So this, the, the blood goes out of the body, gets oxygenated and gets rid of CO2 out of the body. And then it gets pumped back into your body nice and warm and you know without air bubbles because that could be a problem you can't have air bubbles in your blood so what they generally do is they take they remove the diseased heart and then they take the transplant the donor heart and they transplant it into the person but then they have to take medication anti-rejection medication for the rest of their lives because even though they do tissue and blood type and whatever matching it's not exactly the same tissue. You know, the genetics are different. So in order to prevent losing a transplant, kidney, liver, heart, lungs, whatever, um, the patients will have to take anti-rejection anti medication for the rest of their lives. Okay, I keep saying we need it there. Well, we are needing there now. So in our hearts and in the one video right at the beginning of the section, you remember that there's these little patches of cells and they are our natural pacemakers. They've got these strange names, which you don't need to know. And that's where the heartbeat is generated. The top one causing the atria contract, and then this, these bottom nerve fibers here causing the ventricles to contract and push blood out. So atria, ventricles out, atria, ventricles, blood out. And if those don't work properly, then you have a arrhythmia. Now that little video I showed you of the heartbeat, and they talked about listening at different parts of the chest, they can actually figure out which valve isn't working. All right, so um, faulty valves can also cause irregular heart rate, as well as a faulty natural pacemaker, the cells that are not innovating, starting that heartbeat every single time. So then what they do is, and there's so many new types now, okay? They attach a pacemaker to the person's heart and it, it sends a, an electrical signal to, um, to normalize a proper electrical sig signal, a rhythmical electrical signal to normalize the person's heart. Okay, and there's many, many different types. And then you can see it under the skin of this gentleman's chest. All right, so that is the end now. And um, it's interesting. It's something I think that you do need to know. It doesn't mean I'm going to ask you absolutely everything, but you can definitely go and have a look at page number 74. And it's just a little bit of information just to give you that background. So that you are aware and do not get a huge fright if I do give you a comprehension or a graph or something or a table on one of the disorders of the cardiovascular system. People, we are finished. That's the end of um, circulation, but you do need to please answer the longer questions on page 75. That will be your last task on circulation and the last bit of work for this term. Well done, everybody. Okay. And please remember, you've got to go through this work. Um, it will be tested in the third term.